Hi, this is Beatles author Mark Lewison, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Well, hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, a weekly show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a program in which we focus on what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show. Some of you know me for another Beatles program that I host, which is called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my weekly co-host for Things We Said Today, Mr. Beatles Examiner himself, and that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, Hey, everybody. How are you doing? On today's show, we have, guess what, another author on the phone. (laughs) It seems like we have one just about every single week, and it's actually a blessing in a way because of the Beatles' 50th anniversary. It uh, it has brought on so many, so many Beatle books that have come out all at once. And um, we are being joined by Chuck Gunderson, who has written a brand new book called Some Fun Tonight, and it covers the Beatles' North American tours from 1964 through 1966. Chuck, welcome to Things We Said Today. Hi, Ken. Thanks so much for having me on today. Let's just start off the conversation by asking you a very basic, simple question. What made you want to do a book on the Beatles' North American tours? Well, there are so many books, as you know. I mean, you mentioned so many books. And uh, the reason I did it is because uh, when we pick one aspect of the Beatles' career, like so many people do, I happened to pick the live concert performances they gave throughout the years. And I originally started with a big project. I wanted to uh, take Mark Lewis's book, which I love so much, The Beatles Live, mm. and expand it and make it great to every show they ever did. But it was way too much. It would have been 20 volumes. So I decided, let's just do the North American tours all three years. However, it went from one volume to two volumes. It's amazing. I have to say, the, the book is absolutely... I, I was sitting here reading it before we went on the air, and I, I, my mouth, just, you know, you just your mouth just drops at all the all the graphics and the pictures and, and all the details that, that you had in there, Chuck. Uh, I mean, it's just amazing. How long did it take you to do this? From start to finish, Steve, it took about eight years, and I really ramped it up the last two years because I realized hey, the Beatles' 50th anniversary is coming up in February of 2014. I really worked day and night to get it out in that uh, time frame so it could be there and released on February 1st. And the and the other question, well, the follow-up I would have to that is there's so many rare, well, not only the rare pictures, but the, but the graphics, the contracts. I mean, it's like walking through a museum looking at that book. Mm. How did you yeah. manage to get all that stuff? Oh, I appreciate that question, and there were just so many difficult aspects of putting this book together. The first was the photos alone. Uh, I didn't want a book where everybody had seen the same photo over and over, so I decided I really wanted to dig deep, and I dug deep. I had to call every college archive, uh, library, newspaper, private photographers, uh, some of the sad things are is that uh, they would find the file, they would go to look at it, they would open it, and the photos would be missing. They'd been stolen or lost through the years. But I set a goal. I wanted to have photos from every show they ever did, and not just one, but numerous photos from every North American show they did. And I'm really proud to say I accomplished that goal. The documents alone were, were incredibly tough to find. I Luckily, a few years back, I found a treasure trove of documents from Brian Epstein's estate uh, that had all the planning and contracts and letters that went back and forth, uh, beginning with the 1964 tour. So they are featured in the book. And then I also had to find all the memorabilia that the uh, promoters used to advertise the shows, whether they be newspaper ads, handbills, posters, programs, tickets, anything that they did uh, about the Beatles' uh, show in their city, I had to find it, and I really searched high and low, but I found them. The contracts alone are fascinating to to look at, 
And uh, I'm referring mainly to the contracts between NEMS, Brian Epstein's company, and GAC. And yeah. you, you find out so much in all the contracts, how much the Beatles made for each show, what the total costs were, how much it cost for security, everything down the line. I mean, did you was it a problem acquiring the rights to print that stuff? No, they came from a private collection, and I received permission to reprint those. And, uh, yeah, the contracts are a fascinating look at the history of the three tours. And what's even more interesting is, along with the performance contract, is I have the riders that were attached to each year for all three years. And these riders are interesting because in 1964, basically all the Beatles demanded was some clean towels and some cots and maybe a portable TV and a cold case of Coca-Cola. (laughs) <laughs> and even in 1966, the final year of touring, they didn't demand that much even then. It was archaic to the standards of what rock stars demand today. Didn't they demand, though, that uh, they not play in front of segregated audiences? Yeah, that's an interesting point you brought up, Steve, because let's look back at the history of the tours. Uh, after the Sullivan appearances, the tours were already beginning to start to be planned and and get underway. Actually, Brian Epstein met Norman Weiss when the Beatles were taking up their residency in Paris in January. And that was the first time Norman Weiss worked for a company called General Artists Corporation. They were based in New York. They were a talent agency. And Brian felt comfortable with working with uh, Norman. And Norman decided to book the tour for him. So they started about March of selecting cities and different things like that. Well, another thing in American history was was happening, and that was the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So in the spring of 1964, they had planned several cities, a couple of them in the south. One of them was Jacksonville, Florida. The other one was Montgomery, Alabama. And as you know, when the tour was booked and contracts were signed and all that in the spring of 1964, There was one selection that just had to be struck off the list, and that was Montgomery, Alabama. Because even though the Civil Rights Act passed in July of 1964, Alabama was still a little far away from desegregating their arenas and venues that they had in the state. Jacksonville was a little more progressive, but not much. And there was some talk early on in the tour, especially in Las Vegas on August 20th when there's some interviews with the group. And they bring up this issue of segregation and would they play in Jacksonville, Florida. John Lennon later said that he would rather lose his appearance money than appear before a segregated audience. And Paul McCartney said, I just think it's a bit daft to perform before segregated audiences. And it was not the promoter's that were the problem with segregating some of these venues and arena. Some of these cities actually had it written in police because the city owned, the city of Jacksonville owned the Gator Bowl. And it was in their lease. Even though they had integrated college sports, for activities such as rock and roll, they were segregated. And uh, so the Beatles were very firm about that and put that clause in their 1964 contract and all subsequent contracts that they would not play before segregated audiences, which was, that was just a great thing for me to discover and to understand about the Beatles and their uh, their race relations. Hmm. Chuck, a very... Uh, a relationship very, to race relations. A very um, simple statement is made in the foreword by Bob Eubanks, and I really love the foreword that he, that he prepared for this book. And he said something here um, which caught my eye. It didn't really surprise me so much, but it's very powerful. He said, The innocence I saw in 1964 was replaced by a reserved attitude in 1965. Their wide-eyed innocence, the air of being amazed by all that was around them, was gone. And by 1966, they were a, a totally different group of guys, harder to please, a change in personalities, and, I believe, tired of their world. And when I read that, it's like, wow. I mean, we all know how much the Beatles' music changed so rapidly, but as people, they certainly changed just as much. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. Uh, 64, the 64 tour was just, as you know, the, the Mania tour, the Beatle Mania tour, everyone going crazy. 65, they ramped it up. They, they played bigger venues, stadiums, 
sold out Shea Stadium to the tune of 55, over 55,000 people. And then 66, of course, we had what Barry Cashian called in his, his forward, the apology tour, uh, with John Lennon going around and apologizing at every venue they played at for his statements, his misquoted statements that he talked about with regard to Christianity. And so Bob pretty much hit it on the mark. However, I have to say something, and that is, did the Beatles have fun when they were on stage? Absolutely. And that's why I titled the book Some Fun Tonight, because even when you look at footage from 1966, those four guys are having a ball on stage. Even though they're only on it for 30 minutes, they're having a great time. They're musicians, and they love to perform live. Chuck, one, um, there were some interesting artifacts in there besides the contracts. There was the uh, letter the, the mother wrote before the Hollywood Bowl concert. You want to talk about that? That was, that was very <laughs> funny. Yeah, there was, I found a lot of uh, letters from, from parents that were pretty disappointed that the Beatles were coming to their town. And uh, one such was a mother from the, from the L.A. area. Her daughter wanted to go see the Beatles, obviously, and wanted some tickets. And she wrote the Hollywood Bowl Association. That's what we used to do back then. We would just pop a letter in the mail and put a stamp on it and send it to the Hollywood Bowl itself. And, and in it, she was complaining about how high the ticket prices were and, you know, why they should be so high for such mediocre talent and how it's just going to be a mess around there and how everything's going to be damaged. I mean, people, the older set was complaining a bit. Even up where the Beatles stayed in 1964, they stayed in, in, in a mansion owned by Sir Reginald Owen, a British actor. Did they really? I didn't know that. Yeah, in L.A. They actually had reservations at the Ambassador Hotel, which is one of the premier hotels in L.A., but prior to their arrival, the ambassador, like some other hotels, canceled on them. And so it left uh, Brian and, and GAC scrambling a little bit, and Sir Reginald Owens came up, and they rented his house, and they stayed there. It's located still there, located on 356 St. Pierre Road in Beverly Hills. And, yeah, so there was all kind of problems like that, even into 1966 when the group's well-established. Before they came to Memphis, the Memphis City Council actually passed a resolution banning the Beatles from performing there or acknowledging their distaste that they were going to use the Mid-South Coliseum to perform. Now, obviously, they did perform there, but it did take a bribe uh, from promoter Early Maxwell, which I have a copy of the letter of the bribe that was in his file, uh, of him giving a sizable donation to Mayor William B. Ingram's campaign fund to quell things over uh, Chuck, you were just talking about, and this is one of the things that I love about the book, is that it's so thorough in, in every sense of the word, because not only do you talk about the concerts themselves, but also the hotels that the Beatles stayed in, or there may have been hotels that they originally planned to stay in and then that was changed, or, you know, what airports they landed in. And, of course, there's also the memorabilia that you put in there. There's uh, quotes from press conferences. So it's a lot more than just talking about the concerts themselves. But um, there's so many little facts scattered throughout the book that I really enjoyed. Uh, first of all, just going back to the very beginning, I didn't know that um, Brian Epstein considered booking the Beatles for a Shea Stadium in 1964. That was a huge revelation to me, Ken. And when I uncovered these documents, I was absolutely floored when I started looking through them for the first time. Here they were. They were playing in the U.K., uh, very successful, obviously, in the U.K., most of the venues over there are held between two or 3,000 people. And so when Brian was presented the tour plan, the original tour plan, which I have all the copies of the original tour plan featured in the book, so you can look at them, I was amazed at some of the offerings that Norman presented to Brian. He presented 50,000-seat Tiger Stadium. He presented the 80,000-seat L.A. Coliseum. And he wanted to do a show in conjunction with Disneyland. Now, that's something that just didn't make sense to me. I mean, why would Disneyland want to partner in 1964 with what was considered Youth Rebellion? I just couldn't find an answer to it, but it's on Norman's list. But probably the most surprising thing, Ken, was that Norman presented to Brian the play Stadium on September 13, 1964. And as you know, you'll see in the book, too, as, as Brian marked through the list with his pencil of which venues he'd like to accept and which he'd like to reject, he 
obviously rejected Shea Stadium, and he opted for the smaller Baltimore Civic Center on that day. They did two shows there, September 13, 1964. But I think I've got to give Brian Epstein a lot of credit here. Brian could have went all for broke. He could have taken all those huge venues, booked them in there, but it was a huge risk. Who knows if they would have even filled them in 1964. So Brian, being the able manager that he was, decided to choose more conservative venues, even though they were huge to the Beatles here in the Americas. Because in Britain, they're kind of playing to two or 3,000 people. Now in America, they're going to start playing to the Hollywood Bowl, 17,000 people. You know, Maple Leaf Gardens, two shows. You know, all these larger venues, but were mid-sized, to those that lived here in the Americas. And so Brian realized that he wanted to tense up the demand, he wanted to create more demand, so that then when they came back in 1965, he was going to go all for broke if the 64 tour was successful. Well, not only that, I mean, no other major rock act had sold as many seats as Shea Stadium in 65 anyway. So to be presented with an 80,000 arena in 64, I can understand yeah. being apprehensive. <laughs> yeah, totally surprising when I saw that. The the Coliseum, the L.A. Coliseum show, for those listeners who don't know the, where that is, it's, it's in Los Angeles. It's where the Olympics were held. It's uh, it's just this huge, huge arena still, still in existence down there. And um, it was an 80,000-seat show, and he was either going to partner with, like I mentioned, Disneyland, or he was going to par- partner with Dick Clark, or he was going to partner with the Feld Brothers. Now, the Feld Brothers were a huge uh, promotion team out of the D.C. area. They actually promoted a couple shows on the 64 tour, the the, uh, Dallas show and the Baltimore show. And then later in 66, they promoted the D.C. uh, stadium show. And so those were three choices that, that Brian had to choose from. Another interesting selection, Ken, that I, for the East Coast listeners, was that Norman presented to Brian to play three shows daily, three days in a row, in a place called Freedom Land. And Freedom Land was like a large amusement park uh, on the East Coast that was only in existence for a few years. But uh, he was going to cram people in there for $1 to $2 a head and have the Beatles come out three times a day for three days in a row. Brian soundly rejected that, and he decided to play Forest Hills instead. That's interesting. I was at I I visited Freedom Land back in the '60s because I used to live on the East Coast, and um, I don't remember really how big it was. I mean, it was a competitor for Palisades Park, which was which everybody's heard of because of the Freddie Cannon song. But it was I I seem to remember it was a little bit smaller, and uh, I actually I interviewed a disc jockey named Clay Cole who used to host shows there all the time, and um, in fact, the day we went, I remember that Jack Jones was there, which was a crazy, crazy, crazy uh, idea to you know be singing uh, at a at a music park. But um, anyway, Chuck, I was going to ask you, the accommodations that they had, for the most part, were you know today, for example, you'd get you know the best hotels, the super, you know the superstar accommodations near the venues and all that. That didn't always happen with the Beatles, and specifically the, the reason I know that is because. Here in the Bay Area where I am, they stayed in Palo Alto at the Cabana Hyatt House when they had to go to San Francisco, which Palo Alto to San Francisco probably back then wasn't maybe more than a 15-minute drive. Today it would have taken you an, at least an hour. And that, and that blew me away when, when you know, to think about that. I've been to the Cabana here that they stayed at. It's a dinky little hotel. It's not a... It's, I mean, it's a multi-story hotel. I don't know. Have you, are, are you, you, um, you agree with with that that they, that some of the accommodations they had weren't, uh, you know, weren't superstar accommodations? Absolutely, Steve. And and what's funny about that? You mentioned the Cabana. That was 1965. I mean, they already gone through 64. You would think they would get better accommodations in 65. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I have a series of photos uh, at the 1965 San Francisco show. That was the, the tour closer. I mean, after that show, they were going to wake up in the morning at the Cabana. They were going to go to the airport and fly home to the U.K. Well, in the book, I found these photos of them 
walking out the back door of the cabana and parked out back is this freight truck. Now, remind you, these guys are international superstars at this time. They sold out Shea Stadium. And at the end of this highly successful tour, the sequence of photos shows them getting into the back of the dirty freight truck. Ringo's wearing some really nice pants, I can tell. He doesn't even want to sit on the floor. He's shown crouching in the back of the freight truck. And this freight truck is going to take him to San Francisco International for the flight back to the U.K. But, yeah, I mean, some seedy hotels, another one in 1955, which is a pure curiosity to me, is that when they played Minneapolis, there were two hotels there called the Leamington. One was the Leamington Hotel, and another one was called the Leamington Motor Lodge. Well, you would think they would have stayed in the more gleaming and, and nicer Leamington Hotel. They stayed at the Leamington Motor Lodge. There was basically hardly any security there. The hotel fell into disrepair later on. It was actually used as a homeless shelter for a while before it was destroyed and made into a parking garage. I mean, just crazy, lousy hotels. In 1964, they stayed at the Congress Inn in New Orleans, which was basically a one-story motor court hotel next to a swamp. Uh, in Indianapolis, they stayed at the, the uh, Speedway Motel, which was an, kind of an open venue motel. It had, uh, you know, an open courtyard and balconies where people could get to them very, fairly easy. But, yeah, over and over and over, they're staying at these crummy hotels. Now, they did stay at some nice ones, let's face it, and they did stay at some nice mansions in L.A. when they were doing the West Coast Swing. But, it, it was just rock and roll touring and the industry back then. It was being invented, I believe, at the time. And it was it was archaic. So weren't they staying at these, these crummy hotels, as you call them, uh, in part maybe to fool the fans, thinking they would never stay there? I don't think so, Ken. I think they were booked well in advance. The fans knew where they were because they were there. I mean, they would the the AM radio station disc jockeys would would allow would let the information out on their radio shows and the fans would show up. I'm not saying every hotel was crummy, but there were quite a few. There were some nice ones as well. As far as the cabana goes, you have the pictures in the book. There were fans there. They knew they were there, and there was local local media coverage because I've seen the um, I've seen some of the uh, the hotel has some of the newspapers of the day hanging up in the hotel. Um, and in fact, they have one of the rooms more kind of memorialized as a beetle room, although they don't tell you which beetle, if any beetle, stayed there. But they have it kind of looking like it did back in the day. But I mean, yeah, I mean, fans knew that at least in Palo Alto, fans knew they were there. There's no question about that. Another re- another revelation you had in the book was about San Diego opening what was supposed to open one of the tours. Yeah, exactly. Now I was completely excited about that because San Diego is my hometown. And when I started going through the tour documents, uh, I saw the original planning sheet, and there it was, August 18, 1964. They were going to start in San Diego, California. They were going to play at Balboa Stadium. And unfortunately for me, Brian Epstein wrote in his pencil with a big word, out, (laughs) O-U-T, contractual obligations in the U.K. They needed just one extra day to finish up what they were doing over there before they could come over to here and start in San Francisco. One of the the many things I have to commend you for in this book, Chuck, is that I really enjoy how you devoted time to the supporting acts on these tours. Thank you. And um, I wasn't aware of, first of all, the Bill Black combo. Bill Black, of course, worked with Elvis Presley. And um, he wasn't there on the, the 64 tour at all because he was ill. Yeah, this is one of the major goals uh, to do in the book for me, Ken, and that was to, to pay homage to the support acts. Many books you read, reference materials, they might they might get a, a line or two uh, that they played. I decided I want to write a brief history about each support act. I want to tell the readers why they got selected to go on the Beatles tour, mm-hmm. and I wanted to find photos of these people. I mean... Come on, how many people know the history of the disco tech dancers and have seen photos of them on stage? Right. And uh, regarding Bill Black, I mean, great choice to start the 1964 tour. 
sadly, Bill fell ill before the tour. He died the next year of a brain brain tumor. Uh, so they replaced him. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the Bill Black combo, you had the Exciters, you know, with Pelham. You had the Jackie DeShannon. You had the Righteous Brothers. I mean, Clarence Frogman Henry. There were some great support acts that really whipped up the crowd ahead of the Beatles. Now, how, how were these acts chosen? Because one of the things that I've always been curious about is, you know, Brian could have promoted his own acts. He could have brought Billy J. Kramer over. He could have brought Jerry and the Pacemakers over. He didn't do that kind of tour. How did they, how did they pick these particular acts? Well, in, 19, in 1965, he picked one of his own acts, and that was Sounds Incorporated. And in 1966, him and Nat Weiss uh, co-produced a band called The Circle, and so they made it onto the 1966 tour. Mm-hmm. But many of these other artists were GAC, you know, General Artist Corporation, kind of stable artists. I mean, some of these... Uh, agents that worked for GAC, uh, they were very uh, connected with some of these support act people. Clarence Frogman Henry, who replaced the Righteous Brothers on the 1964 tour, was actually promoted by Bob Astor. And Bob Astor was an agent for General Artist Corporation. He would go out and help book these different cities that Brian selected. And so many of them had an association with General Artists Corporation. Okay. Just one thing, you, you were talking about the Righteous Brothers. It was very interesting to find out that they didn't stay for the whole tour. And yeah, why? Yeah, that, that, that struck me too, uh, uh, Chuck. Why didn't they stay? Yeah, okay. Well, the Righteous Brothers, as you know, they opened for the Beatles at the Washington Coliseum on February 11, 1964, the Beatles' first American concert. And uh, so they were a natural selection to be a support act on the 1964 tour. And so they booked them, they played, and uh, there were some problems. As you know, the tour started uh, on the West Coast. They, they did San Francisco and Las Vegas and Seattle, Vancouver, back down to the Hollywood Bowl, then over to Denver, then from Denver to Cincinnati. Well, once they passed Cincinnati, for some reason... They felt that the fans over on the East Coast didn't know their music as well as the West Coast fans. Another reason was that they were sick of competing with the fans because when they were singing on stage and trying to recreate those beautiful harmonies that they did, most of the fans would be yelling, we want the Beatles, we want the Beatles. It really came to a head at Forest Hills because the Beatles, in order to get to Forest Hills, they could not drive there from where they were staying in New York. And Norman Wise at GAC and Brian especially had worries of the tunnel getting clogged up with fans and the Beatles not being able to get over to Forest Hills over to Queens. And so what happened is, is they, they rented a helicopter. So the limousine took them from their hotel in New York. They went down to the the Wall Street helipad, they got into the helicopter, and they flew to Forest Hills. There was a couple problems even with that. Number one, the officials at Forest Hills didn't want any helicopter landing on their sacred tennis courts. And number two, there was no dressing room ready for the Beatles to dress in. The promoter for Forest Hills was Ron Delsner, who is actually a big, huge heavyweight in the music industry now. Sure. He's the president of Live Nation. Mm-hmm. He was just basically getting his start. These were one of the first uh, acts he'd ever promoted. And Ron Delsner had only set up a little tent behind stage for the Beatles to dress in. Well, this was absolutely not going to work. And the tour manager who worked for GAC, his name was Bob Bonus, who took some wonderful photos, by the way, he uh, told Forest Hills people, they said, look, the Beatles and Delsner, he told Delsner as well, he said, look, the Beatles are going to dress at your Forest Hills Tennis Club locker room. And if they don't, I'm going to call over to that helicopter. I'm going to turn it around and send it back. So anyways, back to the Righteous Brothers. They're on stage singing their, their hearts out. And all of a sudden, this helicopter appears over them, drowning out their, their, their music as well as the fans drowning out their music. Well, they'd had enough. They went to Brian and said, can we get out of the tour? And Brian, being an honorable man, let them out of their contract. They were actually making more money playing solo gigs at each venue over in the West Coast than they were on the tour. 
Brian let them out. So their last show was in Atlantic City on August 30. They they left and went back home. And so Brian and GAC had to scramble a bit. And Bob Astor came up with uh, Clarence Frogman Henry, who finished out the tour. Hmm. And not only that, but um, and I wasn't aware of this. Brian offered to manage them, and and they did, they and, turned uh, him they, down. They, sound, they soundly rejected it. That's a bit surprising, considering he was the manager of the biggest band in the world. Yeah, I never. Uh, I tried to interview um, the surviving member of the Rush. I always forget it, Bobby Hatfield or uh, Bill Medley. It's, it's Medley, right? yeah. It's Phil yeah, Phil, Phil, Phil Medley. Yeah, I tried interviewing Bill, Bill Medley about that. He is a top interview. You cannot get to him. Hmm. That's a, that's a very interesting uh, situation. That's an interesting. I mean, how does a how does an act turn down being managed by Brian Epstein? Amazing, absolutely amazing. Who were some of the people that were on the tour that were um, traveling on the tour? I know you had a picture in there of Joan Baez, and I know that she and her sister Mimi Farina were traveled with the Beatles uh, at least from San Francisco to. Uh, from L.A. to San Francisco, and and you said that they had act, that Joan had actually been on a couple of dates of the tour. Um, who who was with them that you know of? Well, what's interesting? Let's let's go back and and talk about Joan for a while. Joan was actually with them a lot. They first met on August 26, 1964, when the Beatles played Red Rocks in Denver. Joan was there to play a follow-up concert at the same venue. She wanted to meet them, and I have a picture, actually, of her of that day when they met in Denver for the first time, I found. I don't know how I found it, but I found it. So Joan instantly kind of hit it off with the band. She was invited to tour with them. She was with them on airplanes. She was with them at their private mansion in in L.A., both all three stops. I have pictures of, of her in 1966 sitting around the pool with David Crosby and the Beatles. And uh, John Lennon had a great name for her. He used to call her Miss Florence Nightingale. And the reason he did that is because Joan would kind of scoot herself by the front of the stage and she would assist any girl that fainted. (laughs) Interesting. There's one photo in there. I think this is from backstage at Shea Stadium in 65 where you've got Mick Jagger and Bobby Vinton in the photo. (laughs) That's an interesting combination. You don't see that very often. But, yeah, I mean, Mick Jagger was at the 1965 Shea, Shea Show along with Keith Richards. And, uh, of course, they were able to go backstage. And, and the Rascals were there, uh, which was Sid, Sid Bernstein's managed act. A lot of people think that the Rascals opened for the Beatles in 1965, and, and that's just not the case. The Rascals were there. They were sitting in the dugout watching them perform on stage. But yeah, lots of celebrities, lots of people trying to get to the Beatles in 1965, especially. Now you did not go with Amazon uh, with the usual channels. You have your own website for the book. Um, tell people about the website and how they can order the book through through that. Sure. The website is www.somefuntonight.com. It's all one word. And I decided to go the Bruce Spicer route. I mean, Bruce has been doing this for years. Bruce has been a great mentor towards me. And, uh, I, you know, with Amazon and a self-published author, the problem is is they just take too much money from us that we can't even really afford to cover the printing. Uh, I hope someday that they may be on Amazon, but for the time being, I'm selling them on my, on my website. I know that Gary Johnson has some at Rockaway Records. I know that you can order through the Best for Beatle fans, through Mark Lapidos. If you go onto his site, I'm in their catalog, and you can also order from Tracks UK. He is, uh, Paul Wayne is also carrying the book there. Wow. A lot of different channels there to order your book. And we both, and I, I can't, uh, I think, uh, I don't think I have to speak for Ken, but I highly recommend this book. It's a fantastic book. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I have a few more questions, though. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. First of all, what would you say were the Beatles' favorite moments, if you know, if you're familiar with how they felt about certain shows during these three years? Or what were their worst moments, the the concerts that they dreaded the most? Well, I think uh, in hearing disc jockey interviews, and I heard a lot of them over the years, I think definitely the Hollywood Bowl was one of their favorites. Uh, John, John mentioned, you know, he just he said, I, I just love the bowl, you know, and the energy there. 
Mm. And, uh, you know, they're in Hollywood. I mean, what could be better? I mean, these are four guys from Liverpool. I mean, at the end of their concert touring days, when they, when they did their final bow at Candlestick on August 29th, 1966, they were only three years and 26 days removed from their final bow at the Cavern Club in Liverpool. And so here they are. I mean, Hollywood, what could be better? You know, they're playing before a sold-out audience. The next year they do two shows there, and then the next year they do Dodger Stadium. So I think L.A. was one of their favorite places to play. Probably the worst two places come to mind, and they both happened to be in 1966. One of them was Cincinnati. Cincinnati was a tough show. Uh, they, they had pulled into town. They they were at the Vernon Manor Hotel. They, they went over to the venue at Crosley Field. It was a stormy night. Uh, it started raining. The promoter was too cheap to provide a, uh, a tarp over the stage, even though he was required in his, his uh, rider, his performance rider, that he would provide one. He didn't. The equipment was soaking wet. John Lennon even mentioned, he goes, Hey, if no one else gets electrocuted, I'll give it a go. <laughs> hmm. And um, so, look, they had to cancel that night. It was uh, George Harrison said in anthology, uh, he said it was the only gig they ever canceled. Well, I don't know if that's true, but in North America at least. But they didn't cancel it. They came back the next day at noon. So they get back to the Vernon Manor. It's got to be late at night. They got to get up early again. Paul was sick. He, he kind of had a little bit of the flu bug. And uh, he was not feeling well at all. It's oppressive heat in Cincinnati in August, humid, hot, and they're out there playing a noon gig. Well, guess what? The promoter finally put the tarp over the stage on a, on a sunny day. <laughs> so people at Crosley Field, if you're sitting in the above section of Crosley Field, you're not seeing Ringo at all. He's under the tarp. It's just, and I have pictures of this, and you'll see it in the book of this rinky-dink stage and this amateurish setup. And that's pretty much even what they played in 1966. These setups were amateurish. The other show had to be Memphis. Memphis was just a show they dreaded to go to. Obviously, it was after the comments John made on Christianity. You're down in the Bible Belt. Memphis City Council wanted to cancel the show. You had the Ku Klux Klan protesting. You had church groups protesting. You had parents telling their kids they're not going to see that show. And they dreaded it. They dreaded going there. Barry Cashy mentions it, mentions the flight there and how John felt and how he wanted to get out of Memphis. And uh, Larry Kane asked him a, a question years later. You know, what was the hardest thing you ever did when you were touring? And John and Paul were there, and John readily said, escaping Memphis. They had cherry bomb, firecrackers thrown at them. All of them thought they'd been shot. They literally, after the show, dropped their instruments, ran backstage. The bus was in the kind of garage area backstage of the Mid-South Coliseum. They got on the bus, and they're soaking wet, laden clothes. And uh, they just said, just hightail it out of here. They, they actually changed their out of their stage suits into their, their, uh, their other clothes on the bus. They want to get out of there. Wow. wow. You also, I think you also have to mention Candlestick because Paul, on the bootleg of the, the show, says how cold it is. And having been in Candlestick on some of those cold nights, I can Im just imagine how cold it was up on that stage over second base. I mean, uh, I've been in San Francisco, and, you know, as Mark Twain once said, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. I think it was one of those days because... Mm -hmm. I can imagine. The other, the other thing, Steve, is like, you look at those photos from Candlestick, and I have to say an interesting thing about the photos that I produced in the book. We actually saved those photos. Those photos were, were stolen from the, from the archives of the Chronicle, mm -hmm. and uh, they were kept at a private residence for over, over 20 years. And uh, the owner of that, the photos died, so his wife wanted to put them up for auction. And uh, luckily, she picked a reputable auction house, and uh, that's Fab Four Collectibles, Tom Ben Gelly. I just got to take my hat off to him. So I called him. I said, Tom, these photos are stolen, and uh, you should really, we should really give them back to the rightful owner, which is the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And Tom readily agreed. He immediately took the auction down. 
uh, the lawyers worked out with the consigner uh, getting the photos back, and I'm, I'm really happy to say that the UC Berkeley Bancroft Library has those photos for future generations to look at. But you look at these photos, I mean, they're playing behind a livestock fence. That's 10 feet tall, almost completely obscures them. It mm-hmm. completely surrounds the stage. I mean, it just says it all right there at the final days of touring what this became. It became a circus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've seen other photos. Fo- I've, I've seen some fan photos from that uh, show, and yeah, they're really, it was amazing how it was. But that brings up actually a bigger issue, talking about the Chronicle. The newspaper coverage of the tour at the time, I mean, ever, there was a lot of, you know, looking down the noses of, of the, you know, the old veteran reporters. And I've talked to, I've actually talked to a few reporters who covered them during those days, Larry Kane, including Larry Kane, but others others as well. I mean, Larry King's not one of that, uh, one of them, and I want to make that clear. But I've talked to, veter- you know, veterans in the news business that basically didn't have any, you know, uh, for them it was just a job. And um, I mean, how did you uh, how did you find find that? And also, I wanted to ask, and if I if I can do this, did you find any audio recordings of the tour that we don't know about? Go ahead and ask. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll answer I'll answer that question first, Steve. And 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 unfortunately, no, there is no new audio recordings I have found in the research that I did. But I'm never counting it out. You know how these things are. People will look into a drawer and they'll find this cassette or whatever, mm-hmm. a reel-to-reel. Uh, I guess this, you know, cassette's went around, but I mean a reel-to-reel where there's going to be a live concert on there. I just can guarantee it. Just like that lady is going to show up who was shooting them at Carnegie Hall and from behind the stage, yeah. you know. That, mm-hmm. that lady's got to turn up somewhere, I hope. Mm-hmm. But uh, going back to the newspaper coverage, let's face it, Steve, I mean the newspaper coverage was pitiful. I mean, they were lucky if they got three paragraphs on the show, you know, and a review of the show. And, of course, you had your music critics who worked for the paper then that were so-called music critics. You know, they thought, this sound is terrible. I don't know what people see in this group. They're going to die in six months, whatever. But there was also several who recognized something, and I was really happy to see those and read those because they were really on the cutting edge, and they really saw something in the Beatles that said to them, hey, this group is going to be around for a while. And I have some of those quotes in the book that I found. I have the negative ones. I also have the positive ones. But one thing I'd really like to find out, too, and it would really help out Alan Cozen at the New York Times, mm-hmm. and that is, is what was the set list at the Paramount Theater with the last, basically, show in the 1964, the charity gig? Mm-hmm. I mean, just basic things like that, set list, fan recollections, anything, very tough to find. Had the Beatles played and performed and traveled and toured during the age of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Mm -hmm. we would know their every move. We would know every song they played on stage. We would have a recording of that. Mm -hmm. We would have photos galore. We would have every jot and tittle every word they said in a news conference, everything. We would know exactly what they ate for breakfast, which side of the bed they slept on. Sadly, I had to dig, dig, dig and interview lots of people to find out this information. Well, you did an amazing job here. I've, I've got to ask you one very important question. This, You might be surprised to hear me ask this question, but considering the fact that in 1966, the Beatles were still selling records I mean, the Yesterday and Today album was the number one album. They had a number one single, Paperback Writer. They still were selling records extremely well. Who would deny that they were probably the biggest band in the world in 66? And yet I'm still baffled by the fact that they didn't sell out a lot of their concerts that year. Now, I know that we had the the Beatles are bigger than Jesus comment, and I know what an uproar that caused in parts of the country, but I can't believe that that alone would be such a big factor as to why. I mean, it's only well, three I, years. It's only three years of touring. It's not like you know Americans were tired of the Beatles at that point. Why? Great question. And you have to look back at the history of the tours. In '64, there was actually some seats available. Not every show was sold out. '65, there was a few more seats available. Shea was sold out on August 15, 1965. 55,600 people. They go to San Diego two weeks later, 
there's 10,000 seats that are, that are vacant. Okay, well, 66, we know the reason. I mean, you know, John made his statement. And like Barry Cashian mentioned in his forward, he said, hey, we've seen the Beatles the last two years. They're coming around again this year. Let's maybe skip this year. They're going to come around next year. We'll see them then. Hmm. Sadly, they didn't come around next year. So those that missed it in 66 probably forever regret that they, they didn't go. And you have to remember the venues were even bigger in 66. In 1964, the average size venue was 17,000 seats. In 1965, 30,000 seats. And in 66, even a little larger, 42,000 seats. I mean, they were playing, they had booked Cleveland Stadium. Cleveland Stadium holds 83,000 people. They barely mustered in just over 20,000, 25,000 people at Cleveland Stadium in 66. So that's a good question, and it's going to be forever debated uh, why more people didn't go see him when there was such great demand out there for the music. I'm just not sure of the answer. I know what you're saying, but also compared to 64, there were fewer shows. So if you really wanted to see the Beatles, you had to go to those shows. So Exactly, because, uh, you know, in 64, they just, they just covered it all. I mean, they did, they did 32 shows, they did 26 venues, they played in 24 cities, and they did it in 33 days. They come back in 65, they only do 16 shows, half the number, only 10 venues, 10 cities in 17 days. They made about the same, they made as much money as they did in 64. In 66, they ramped it up just a tiny bit more. They did 19 shows, so they added three shows from 65. They did 14 venues in 14 cities in 18 days. Attendance wise, the first year they, they brought in about 450,000 people. In 65, about 350,000 people. And in 66, about 380,000 people. I'm still baffled. I mean, they're still the biggest band in the world at that point. And and to not sell out Shea Stadium in 66, that's surprising to me. Well, you know, you have to look at it, Ken. The establishment did not look at music, at rock and roll, especially rock and roll uh, aimed at teenagers like they do today. It wasn't the, It wasn't the powerhouse social thing that it was. And in fact, for a lot of us, who were, you know, who had parents who didn't, you know, there were a lot of us whose parents didn't like rock and roll. My parents were not real big rock and roll fans. There were other parents that were. And I think that had a lot to do with it. I mean, some parents didn't want their kids going to these shows because of the crowds, because of the, of the, you know, the long-haired Beatles. There was a whole thing. Times were different back then. Okay, well, you had the I same. Think you have to, I think you also have to realize, uh, Ken and Steve, that that, you have to look at promotion and how these promoters marketed the show. Take, for instance, Memphis. I mean, you had back then you had fragmented, fragmented radio stations. You had dozens and dozens of newspapers. I mean, today you can basically announce it on Facebook. You could, you know, announce it on the national news. People are going to know. You know, you got the internet. You can see whoever you like is where they're playing and which day. I mean, the Beatles. I mean. They're coming to Memphis. Okay, well, you got to be reading your newspaper and making sure you know that you're looking at every ad. And these, these, these promoters would place these really tiny ads in the newspaper. I mean, they're like two inches by four inches, you know, says the Beatles will be here on August whatever, you know. And so I think you have to look at the time and kind of the marketing efforts back then and, and how archaic it was. Mm-hmm. I think that was a big reason. And... Even in New York, I mean, you you still got to to fill Shea Stadium. You got to you got to pull from New Jersey and you know some surrounding areas to, to get people there. Okay, <laughs> I just don't I like don't the see. Answer, I can tell. Uh, I don't no. I don't see the difference between sixty five and sixty six in selling out Shea Stadium. If you listen to the radio, the stations that play the Beatles, I'm sure they said, "Hey, the Beatles are playing at Shea." Yeah, but you have to also bring in the fact that uh, with Lennon's comment on Christianity. That made the big difference well, it, right there? It, it would have pulled people that were going to go to that show, and their mom and dad said, you are not going to go see those you know, people that bash religion. Hmm. I mean, Brian almost canceled the 1966 tour entirely. What's interesting is that he announced the tour on, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was March 3rd, 1966. He announced the, the world tour. They were going to play West Germany, Japan, 
the Philippines and North America. It would begin May 1st at Wembley Stadium. Okay? On March 4th, the day after the Maureen Cleave interview appeared in London's Evening Standard. Now, no one really cared about John's comments in the U.K. It was just another rant from a pop star. It didn't really hit in America until North America until uh, that uh, until Dayplus brought it out before the show. In uh, before the show happened in July. I mean, Brian was nervous. He flew into New York, you know, the first part of August, held a news conference to tell tell the world that John's comments were taken out of context and misquoted. He was prepared to refund all the promoters. If any promoter came to him and said, Brian, I want out of this, I'm not selling tickets, he would have let him out of the contract. He even reduced guarantees for some of the promoters who were not selling tickets. I think that's very honorable of Brian to do that. Hmm. Oh, yeah. No, I can understand the Bible Belt being upset, you know, but in other parts of the world, especially the Northeast, I can't see it really being that affected by that, but that's just me. Well, I mean, it, I mean, it, it is true that there was a lot of, I mean, it was crazy during those years when the Beatles came to town. I remember when I was also in the New York area when they came to Shea Stadium. Um, and I remember, you know, you, uh, WABC went live on the street with the Beatles' arrival to the Warwick Hotel, and they interviewed the Beatles live on the air and, you know, that kind of thing. And, oh, yeah, there was a lot of pandemonium. But, again, you know, um it, you know, there was still things just aren't like they are now. I mean, it's you know, things were a lot different then. Um, you know, the transportation wasn't as streamlined, so you had to drive. You know, you had to drive everywhere. Uh, just about. I mean, there were subways, but I mean, still, it wasn't as easy to get around as it is now. And I don't know. It. Um, I mean, somebody can probably. You know, we can probably debate that one, but it just the whole, the society as, you know, as a whole just wasn't as moving as moved by for example like the way Miley Cyrus does today i mean you know you know thanks to social media and all that that just didn't happen then so well i like ringo's comment in anthology when he uh they mentioned the the 66 j and there was 10,000 less people and he said gee the beatles only played before 45,000 people they're on their way out you know, I mean, 45,000 people is a lot of people to play a concert in front of, you know. Right. All right. Well, we got to wrap things up. So, Chuck, I want to say what the what, uh, great time we had talking to you, and uh, we wish you much success with the new book. It's called Some Fun Tonight. Do you want to give us the full title? Yeah, I do. It's, it's kind of one of those long titles, but it's called Some Fun Tonight, the backstage story of how the Beatles rocked America the historic tours of 1964 to 1966. Hmm. And again, I, I, I definitely recommend picking this up. Anything you ever wanted to know about these tours, it's all covered in the book and more. It's as thorough as you could possibly get in covering uh, the North American tours. Steve? Yeah, um, I can't say much more than, than we've already said. I mean, the book is fantastic. The book is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Chuck, thank you for taking the time to talk to us uh, this has been a lot of fun. Oh, it's so great. And I know we're always mentioning the book, but we have to remember it's called The Books because the books, it's two volumes. It's 616 pages. There's over 800 images. And plus the books are housed in a really attractive slipcase, kind of a collector's slipcase. Uh, so that makes it a really nice touch to it. Uh, one thing I want to mention to you, um, I'm personally acquainted with the people who did your artwork, and they are – because I've worked with them before, but they ought to, ought to get a, uh, some of the credit for what you, what you've done. It's just fantastic. So. Yeah, that was uh, Brad Zucroft and uh, Bambi Nicklin at Omnivorous Media, and they are out of Las Vegas, Nevada. So if you need a book done, go to them. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Chuck, for joining us, and hopefully we'll have you on again sometime soon. We can always talk about this particular topic. Yes, we can. Yeah, you're going to have anniversaries for the next three years, so I'd be happy to come back on. <laughs> okay, you got a deal. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. All Thank right, you. so for things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels thanking all of you and for Chuck Gunderson for joining us, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you, Chuck Gunderson, and we will see you next time. <laughs>